Hello and welcome to a new episode today. I'm Niels Eichhorn, your host here at the War of Rebellion podcast for a civil war. And today I'm joined by, I guess, my new partner in crime for the podcast world. Hopefully I will have him on a few more times, which is Andy Hook from the Portier region of France. So we got two Europeans on today. He is an American Studies PhD student at the University, sorry, Université of Nanterre. That's it. In Paris, France. <laughs> and today we're bringing back, as we announced a few weeks ago, Ben Jenkins from University, gets this one right this time, University of Laverne. And we're going to talk about an article that Ben published recently in the Public Historian. And just as sort of a interesting reminder, I guess, for everyone, we're going to talk about digital history today. Maybe we remember back to Earl Hez when he published The Internet and Civil War Studies in September 2019 and Civil War History, which caused quite some outrage among scholars. So... That might actually come up today as well. We're having a much better topic. So Ben's article is entitled Recasting Uncle Billy. Are Sherman posting digital history and the meaning of the American Civil War in the 20th century in the Public Historian, published in February 2024. So... Ben, welcome back. Um, great pleasure to have you again. How do you feel with two Europeans in the on the other side today? I feel like I'm waiting for the punchline of a joke. Two European <laughs> scholars and an American walk into a bar. I'm just I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, but it's a pleasure to be back with you here today, Niels and Andy. It's um, I really appreciate you, this invitation to come talk about what I think will be hopefully an interesting and eye opening piece of research for a lot of people. Um, but it's my absolute pleasure to be here with two folks in Europe. I mean, it's just amazing that we can do this thanks to the miracle that is Zoom. Austria, France, and California. I mean, it's amazing. Exactly. Hmm. Well, there's a punchline for you. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Uh, one of us has terrible food, one of us has good food, and one of us has mediocre food. And our I listeners can pick which one it is. <laughs> I think I know where you're coming from. I think I know who's who, but okay. I'm not a fan of frog legs, so everyone can pick their own. <laughs> um, so let's start, Ben. How how did like we just talked recently about your book on citrus planting in California, and then you like literally immediately have another piece coming out with the Civil War and something totally different. So how how did you get interested in Sherman? I guess, well, the Civil War was really my entry point to American history, which I think is true for a lot of folks who end up studying that subject. I just have always been fascinated by this huge clash, you know, that involves pretty much every segment of American society, North, South, White, mm -hmm immigrant, native born, indigenous, male, female. And so I just have always had that interest in the Civil War. I think that really is what turned me into a historian originally. I'll never forget though, that one of the first meetings I went to in grad school, it was like an orientation session where they had a couple of faculty members at my alma mater, UC Riverside, sit down all the new graduate students and say, okay, what's your potential research area? What's your research area? What's your research area? And at the end they're like, okay, nobody's doing the Civil War which is good because that's already been written about so much that no one has anything new to say about it. And so, I mean, obviously that's not true, right? There's cutting edge scholarship coming out every year. Um, but I guess this article was sort of my way of saying, well, darn it, I do want to have some sort of interaction with the topic that got me interested in history to begin with. And the fact that there's a like-minded community of people on Reddit who sort of I'm going to put my own political views out there, share a lot of what I feel about the South and mm -hmm. the role of the Confederacy in America's national discourse today really got me to think about how digital publics are, are still tapping into this rhetoric of history, trying to make it relevant to their experiences mm -hmm. and trying to make it something that matters for 21st century politics. Um, 
not to get too, too far from the actual article itself, but I actually have the homepage of Sherman Posting open right now in the very top piece, if I can share it here, actually, always better to show than to tell, right? Um, is this article showing, you know, a bunch of people in Texas standing with Trump. The silent majority stands with Trump, this meme says. And underneath them is a picture of William Tecumseh Sherman, red background, and he's saying, you look flammable. I'm obviously <laughs> calling to mind stuff like the burning of Atlanta or the march to the sea. Um, so just the fact that people still see the Civil War as something that is relevant to what America is, its national identity in 2024, uh, really fascinated me. And so I wanted to try to like, sort of pull out what does this mean for digital history? What does this mean for us as scholars? What does this mean for having a public or set of publics that is hopefully informed by historical discourse? No, it, uh, Andy. Um, well, that's that, that's really fascinating. Um, and uh, I, I think for Niels, it's the same thing that we both got into uh, history. And for me, it's been my entire life and it's with the civil war that was my mm -hmm. that was my main thing too at the very from the very beginning um but this uh has really um opened my eyes actually to the um i guess importance of bringing that history into mm -hmm. today's discourse making it you know palatable for and, and making it um bridging the gap as you say you know between between uh scholarly what's been written and there's no no wouldn't need to write any more about the civil war because it's already been written about to this making it absolutely uh absolutely contemporary i mean everything is is so linked to yeah, anyway <laughs> well i guess the question there is can we could we cons like people sometimes are like oh i don't like books because it's so boring to read like could we could we perceive of like something like reddit or like social media and stuff like maybe as sort of a sexy new way of doing history i think we have to i, I always i teach classes on public history at the university of laverne and i always tell my students every time you tweet every time you put out a story on instagram or a post on facebook mm. you're leaving behind a trace of yourself you're creating a primary source that scholars yeah. 50 or 100 years from now will use to understand the human experience in mm -hmm. 2024 so i think that the sources that folks are using to engage with the world around them these are absolutely going to be primary sources in the future, and we really have to take that seriously. We have to consider the fact that, you know, a lot of people these days are not going to leave behind a written record, but they're going to leave behind a very rich digital trail. And so I really try to encourage my students to think, how is this going to communicate your history? How are you sort of putting together an archive of the self whenever you go on to Twitter and retweet something that Elon Musk says and whether you agree with or disagree with that? Most of them disagree with it for what it's worth, but I digress. Um, so I think, you know, di the digital is just where we are. Like when I was in grad school, it was very popular to say, oh, digital is the future. Digital is what people are going to be doing in five or 10 years. That future has arrived. This is how people primarily communicate today. And so if we neglect that and if we neglect the digital communities and the sort of messages that those communities are creating, then I don't think we're doing our job <clears throat> as scholars, especially me being a public historian that we're not following what the public's doing and i'm just going to throw it out for for all three of us to kind of think about and maybe come up with an answer like what is digital history that's it right like what is it <laughs> i mean i took a course on it and i'm not sure i have a good answer um like well, i mean uh, go ahead how about, how about this um i received my my master's in 2004 and i, I got back into the to, into my PhD, starting my PhD, uh, 12 or 13 years later, and mm -hmm. everything changed. And so now people are talking about digital history and digital humanities. It came out of nowhere for me. Yeah, I mean, completely out of nowhere. So for me, this is a really good explanation, this article, because it dives in and it digs in and it goes back to talking about Web 2. Because people don't talk about Web 2 or people don't talk about Web 1 anyway. Exactly. Well, thank you for saying that. Yeah, and that's, I completely agree with you, Andy, that the digital landscape has changed completely. Back in 2005, I think it was, uh, two scholars, Daniel Cohen and, um, and I think it was David Thalen, wrote a fantastic book on digital history, where they sort of overviewed 
what's the history of the internet, how have scholars used it to communicate with each other, how have scholars used it to like put primary sources on the web, whether that's big stuff like Library of Congress or more local projects like college libraries. And so for them, when this book was published in 2005, digital history is very much something that scholars did put online and the public would then absorb. Whereas with Web 2.0 moving forward, it's very much participatory, right? Like the audience, and I use audience in quotation marks here, is doing just as much of the heavy lifting. In many cases, a lot of these the Civil War buffs on Sherman posting will know obscure details about certain battles that I certainly don't know a whole lot about since they've done a lot of the reading. Um, but the point is that they're producing content and ideas. They're not mm -hmm. just passive absorbers of information. They're they're producing, even without us as scholarly mediators. So mm -hmm. maybe the sort of frightening thing that we have to do is re-envision what our role here is mm -hmm. in an odd with a group of users that's already very historically informed and literate. I suppose we could focus on, you know, skills teaching and things like that, but I feel like they have as much to teach us about what the past means in the 21st century as we have to teach them. Wh whose job is it to curate the the study of history? Yes, that's exactly I mean, the question. Like yeah, that's one of the main things that I really wanted people to take away from this piece, right, is that it's a participatory, collaborative endeavor. This isn't to dismiss scholars entirely, because I think that there are still certain things that we can and do do that sort of set us apart from non-scholars. We engage with primary sources in ways that maybe other people don't. We spend our entire careers right, flying around to different archives to do just that. Um, but we are just sort of one node in the digital universe now. And we're a different node for sure, but we have to pay as much attention to the other content producers. Hmm. Yeah, and I, I think that's sort of a good point that you're raising when it comes to digital history, right? Of like, and and the memes and the Reddit forum with Sherman, and it's sort of like, it it historians have a hard time surrendering control. I feel like that you kind oh, of yes. want that you have studied it for so many years. You wrote a book about it, and now now comes along this untrained person that takes the knowledge and creates something completely different with it that may or may not be totally true to the historic to historic accuracy right like i think when we think about it we saw that a lot with the 1619 project too where it's like all these dinosaurs in the profession who all of a sudden were up in arms how dare a new york times reporter completely alter the narrative of of the United States. I, you're absolutely right. Historians are sort of loath to admit the fact that really anybody with the ability to read and write and with some form of critical engagement can do history, can write about the past. I mean, we have so many journalists pumping out books about every historical topic every year, right? Like, okay. we're not like physicists or doctors where you really have to be an exclusive club and you can't let outsiders in. But, yeah, I think a lot of historians I found are very loath to sort of like, well, I've studied this topic for 50 or 60 years. I've been from every archive from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up to College Park, Maryland, where the National Archives is, is based. So it, it's really time to start thinking about what can the public do that we can't. Well, but then that also raises the question, and this is one of the things that I really enjoyed here, uh, is uh, you you talk about digital history, of course, and you talk about popular history and public history. So there's a kind of melding of all three, popular, public, and, 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 and scholarly history that all blend together perfectly into this melding of of, of ideas and nuance uh, into uh, the digital history that you're that you're talking about. It's a great point, Andy. I think we as historians so often get locked up in sort of what are our divisions, right? Like oh, what right. is our specific area? Like I am an Americanist, so I don't really consider East Asia or I don't really consider what's going on in Europe in the 19th or 20th centuries. Whereas the reality is the historical people that we're studying very much did so. I mean, a lot of the, to come back to my first book about railroads in California, a lot of these guys were very interested in capturing East Asian trade, and they were reliant on capital that was flowing in from uh, particularly London, but also continental Europe as well. So I think um, that sort of 
disciplinary division and its artificiality is something that you've pretty successfully applied, Andy, to popular public and scholarly history. Maybe the disciplinary boundaries there are a little bit more malleable now that we occupy this digital universe and can share information much more effectively than we would have been able to do even 25 years ago. Well, and then not just, well, there's also sparking new debate and uh, germinating new ideas and initiating new topics yeah. and new avenues of of uh, understanding of, of of the past in a different context, contemporary context, uh, all sorts of stuff. Yeah, exactly. I think one of my favorite things about this this subject is that it's constantly evolving. People are constantly producing new ideas, new sources, new memes. And I remember when I was originally writing this piece in 2022, the Supreme Court was looking at potentially overturning abortion. And so um, not to get too political into that and not to take a stance one way or another, but one of the first things that people did on Sherman posting was to be like, oh, this activist Supreme Court is curtailing women's civil liberties in the 2020s. Let's compare that to how Roger Taney handed down the Dred Scott decision back in the 1850s and how he essentially stripped you know, civil rights away from millions of people, free or enslaved in the United mm -hmm. States. And so to make that comparison to like somebody literally made a meme showing Roger Taney and Samuel Alito next to each other being like, hey, look at these two activist judges who are stripping away civil rights. It's, it's just amazing to me. I think that's something that you know, historians, if they wanted to do that, they'd have to write an op-ed into a professional journal or into a, a trade magazine doing that. Whereas on Reddit, all you can do is slap together two images, come up with a pithy caption, and boom, you've made a meme and you've sparked discourse that would have taken weeks or months for a scholar be, to be able to accomplish just because of the boundaries of peer review and the timing of publication. So the speed at which the internet moves and how it's able to create those new contexts suggests an agility that mm -hmm. some of these older formats just weren't capable of matching. Yeah, and I was just thinking when you said that too, it's sort of like the like today's speed knowledge interest is just I want something now. I don't want it in two months. I, I it needs to be there. And like yeah, the profession sometimes with the old way of moving is too slow. I mean, we have things that I mean, there's been recently some debates about some of the comments that one of the editors made, like made by history at the ti at time magazines these days, or um, some of the blogs that are out there. But I, I feel like it's a, it's an, it's a scary world in part because you have to be on the ball. You have to move fast. There's so many people wanting to share it, but then let me put it this way. Do do we kind of feel that sometimes that could lead into like bad comparisons too? I think that's absolutely possible. Yes, that people will reach the wrong sort of conclusions or act in ways that are maybe potentially harmful. Mm -hmm. um, I This whole case study that I centered the article around Sherman posting, I think is pretty activist. They're very concerned with civil rights, with sort of promoting mm -hmm. a, sh a shared national identity. But if you were to go to other corners of the Internet, even other communities on Reddit, you would mm -hmm. see people sort of taking history and using it divisively. Mm -hmm. One of the case studies that I like to point to is in November of 2016, just going into December as well. Donald Trump had just won election to the presidency of the United States, and he was toying around with this idea of what he called a Muslim ban, of forbidding people from Muslim nations from coming into the United States. And as justification for this, he said, oh, there's historical precedent, because in the 1940s, the government of the United States authorized the military to lock up all Americans of Japanese ancestry. So he's pointing to this historical comparison, right, as a, as a means to deprive civil liberty, to close the borders. And I thought, what? this is a monstrously creative way to use the past in the present. I mean, he's he is relying on historical um, precedent, right? But I think in a way that most of us would probably be wagging our fingers out and saying, you know, that's not really acceptable. That's not the kind of past that you should be looking at to justify your political agenda in the 21st century. And certainly corners of the internet are like that as well. They'll look at, um, you know, justifications for slaveholding 
as, oh, we could recycle these arguments into why certain segments of American society are still kept down today. I, yeah, there's, I could go on endlessly about this, but yes, certainly there are ways in which people can pervert the past, can create sort of divisions and segregations that are very harmful to our discourse in the present and our hopefully shared collective identity. They're more interested in creating division than they are in building bridges. Okay. Are there any lost cause reddits? <laughs> Yes, yes, there okay. are. There's one called Southern Liberty. <laughs> From your reaction, Liberty. I kind of sense there's a lot of them. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that there's a lot of like lost cause subreddits per se. There's just a lot of reactionary communities that sort okay. of will tap into lost cause rhetoric. Mm. And certainly the biggest one is Southern Liberty. You really get pretty much everything you need to know about the community from its name, right? Like they want yeah. very much to sort of have that separatist notion that the southerners tried and failed to implement back in the 1860s so it's the rhetoric of lost causism of secession is, is not dead i mean when you've got politicians out there like marjorie taylor green saying there needs to be a national divorce between red and blue states i think studying the civil war has never been as relevant as it is today totally um and we're bringing you back into the picture like um because since we have, like, I'm I'm still too fresh on the European continent. I'm not going to make much comment. But how is it in France? Because in the U.S., you have sort of a very, you have sort of some of the ivory tower scholars, people that kind of are like, ooh, I I don't engage the public, even though some of my books will be read by the public. You have these very public focused ac academics and journalists that write for it. You have like the whole social media reddit realm out there that kind of produces stuff in various forms how is it in how is it in france is like are trained historians much more active in the public view or is they kind of hiding yeah. away at the sorbonne no 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 i mean there, there are people like that um and they're i find them hard to deal with <laughs> but no there's more um there's a lot more uh, interaction between um, a lot of more interviews, um, television, uh, newspapers like Le Monde, um, mm -hmm. instead of going to a someone from the so-called ivory tower, they will go uh, find a med de conférence somewhere, so an assistant or associate professor, and um, see what they have to say on on a, on, on current events. Um, and you get a wide wide range of uh, of interaction, and it's really it's really it's it's a relief actually um to know that there are people i mean and it's not like in in france i don't know how it is in austria or germany for that matter but in in, in france there are a lot of people who are in say my position i'm a tenured uh, middle school teacher and i'm doing my phd and i'm not going to teach in, in university setting because i don't i don't enjoy teaching right. to adult uh, teaching adults um, and so there are actually a lot of uh, PhDs who are non-university faculty, and so they have a lot more um, freedom to do to, to publish uh, more trade type uh, books, uh, to have blogs and podcasts and all sorts of things. Um, and one thing I have noticed in in France, a lot more in France, there's a lot more of this in France than it is than there is in the English speaking world, is there are a lot more there seem to be a lot more uh, digital uh, digital um, reviews and digital um, and journals mm -hmm. um, that are online and open access, mm -hmm. which gets your stuff out there immediately. There's, there's no turnaround. Right. Um, and so whenever there's say, a symposium or a conference, um, there's often immediate turnaround within a few months of publication of papers of said papers on, on a uh, on, on a digital um, journal website for for for, for a personal for, for a professional organization or something like that. So okay. it's actually really really um, open and I think a lot freer, mm. while still being peer reviewed. Right. But then there's right. also like Ben, like you're saying, there's also there's a lot of of um, a lot of online online discourse as well. Now. There's a lot of racism and stuff 
in France too. Um, and you especially see that, well, I see it especially on um, some on Twitter, which X, I'm not gonna call it X, um, or Facebook, um, which, yeah. I, don't no, know. I, hope, I hope that answers your question. No, I kind of was kind of sensing, like, uh, I will say that, like, looking at some of the things in, in Austria, I, I don't watch TV, I don't have a TV. <laughs> um, Better but, off. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. But I kind of looking at some of the kind of taking public history more into sort of the built environment side, I, I very often look at some of the things going on, I feel. Um, very sad because it's sort of like there's there was a historic building here and it just got torn down because of traffic needs or because of the war happened and we didn't rebuild this or like oh you know i need to there's this beautiful historic neighborhood behind me um or like where i sit behind me it's, it's actually a few minute walk but like kind of like a bit of a suburban environment like a lot of houses that looks the same but they don't look the same anymore because people have like added something here or like built something out there up the roof a little bit and it it sort of destroys the character of it i get why they did it but it's sort of i i kind of get a bit of a feel that there isn't as much valuing of history um as sort of perceived, oh, it's boring. It's not important anymore. So, it that's what I found really refreshing was Ben's piece that there is this very mm -hmm. strong um, communities there in in the U.S. at least that looks at that picked a Civil War general and said, "This is what we're going to discuss and use to talk about various contemporary political issues." It's the degree to which history has sort of been politicized in the United States to which it is at the front and center of our public culture is astonishing. I mean, you brought up the 1619 project, for instance, right? Like that's mm -hmm. obviously such a huge point of contention to a lot of older established scholars who have made their name sort of uh, coming to grips with a certain view of the American Revolution that's now being challenged. You've got people on the floor of Congress, again, calling for either a national divorce or pointing to history as like an example of, oh, no, we need to actually come together and be more progressive minded. Oh. Um, but just the fact that the past is so contested in the United States, and of course, to say nothing of the biggest, most relevant debate, right, which is what do we do with our Confederate monuments and memorials? Do those even have a place in public settings? It's just... It's almost heartening to see that at least Americans care about history, at least they're trying to make it relevant to their daily lives. And in the case of Sherman posting, I think they're doing that in a really productive way, right? To mm -hmm. say, you know, this is who we are, civil rights, union forever, and not subverting the national government, not trying to promote racism. That's really sort of the raison just for this community. And I'm especially sort of shocked at how they've made Sherman their poster boy for this, given how vocally racist he was against African-Americans, free and enslaved as well as indigenous peoples. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that, to their credit, Sherman Posting has reckoned with. They said, yeah, he's, you know, he's racist. We realize that we have an imperfect idol, but sort of there were no major forward progressive thinkers in the 19th century, right? I guess we could look at maybe a handful of reformers who wanted to actually help indigenous communities. But the fact that they've like, as I've touted with the article title here, recast Sherman to meet what their needs are in 2024, mm -hmm impresses me gives me hope that history is something that people care about and will continue to find relevance in in the future now I, I'm, I'm gonna ask it why do you know why they picked sherman like i mean why not grand why not like you want a lightning rod phil sheridan yeah <laughs> no yeah <laughs> george armstrong Absolutely. custer hey. yeah well custer was a loser i guess so that's one thing. well yes yeah, so <laughs> also um I think that they gravitate towards Sherman because he was, you know, he becomes sort of the face of this total war effort, right? And scholars yeah. have debated whether or not it was actually total war that he practiced. It's not like he went after civilians, right? But the fact that he, you know, went in and was willing to raid Southern plantations and to burn crops and to burn uh, Columbia when he reached the, excuse me, Columbus, when he reached the, the capital of South Carolina. I was right the first time. It is Columbus. Columbia. Excuse yeah. me. Yep, you're right. Um, just the fact that he's like, you know, willing to go to these extreme lengths to preserve the union. 
I think is sort of indicative of the fact that people today are like, well, we're under threat as well. We also need to go to mm -hmm. extreme lengths to preserve the union from enemies, foreign and domestic. And to be fair, there is a certain amount of uh, admiration for Grant. I think that folks on Sherman Posting are uh, taking part in the reevaluation that's going on of Grant's presidency, particularly his ferocious battles against the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, but Sherman, just the fact that he is a lightning rod, the fact that Southerners say, oh, no, he's this destructive ogre, sort of allows people to come in and say, actually, no, he you know, followed traditional rules of war. He may have extended those to using civilian resources, but he wasn't a war criminal in the modern sense of the word. And the fact that he sort of took the first steps towards total war in defense of what he believed was right, in defense of unionism, is an example that all of us can follow today. And maybe we just need to pluck that racism aside, acknowledge that it existed, but sure. obviously not perpetuate it into the 21st century. Well, and then uh, jumping on that, uh, uh, on on Twitter, you see all the, well, and probably I, uh, elsewhere, you see cosplayers, these CS cosplayers who are using uh, anonymous accounts, General Lee, the general, whatever. Uh, and they always, always, always use a picture of Sherman, a meme with Sherman and some racist uh, direct quote from 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 his from his memoirs or from a from a letter where he's talking about some sort of ra awful racist quote as some gotcha uh, against mm -hmm. anything that would be that they that they perceive as uh, against lost cause ide ide ideology. Yeah, exactly. And you really you have to see these gotcha moments for what they are. It's like, well, what are you trying to prove with this? That, oh, it's okay that Robert E. Lee owned slaves because Sherman was racist too. I mean, that's not, right, yeah. the two wrongs do not make a right, yeah. my dear CS cosplayers. That's it. Or like, oh, I have black friends, therefore I'm not racist, right? Yes, yes. exactly. The the, tie, the tried and true friend, right? Like, oh, I have one yeah. black friend who said yeah. something yeah. vaguely nice about the Confederacy. So that's okay. that makes it all okay. Yeah, no, it's... <laughs> It's uh oh goodness. Um on the other hand, I kind of as you were talking, I kind of wondered like is it maybe on purpose because Sherman is that much of a lightning rod for Southerners, right? Like he's that fire and brimstone guy. He is just this like if if the Southerners had to draw Sherman would probably be like some winged dragon like fire breathing creature. Because he is such a like, even just perceived, right? We're not talking reality; it's all perception here. Perceived bad guy. I think you're right. I think there is an element element of sort of being provocative there. Uh, Lord knows that people online like to be provocative, from 4chan mm -hmm. to Twitter X to Reddit, right? They like to take the most offensive or negatively thought provoking thing possible and sort of add new layers and new contexts to it. So I think in part, this is a reclamation project, right? To sort of restore Sherman from being this destructive general, as he was known, to being actually a, an inadvertent, very inadvertent champion of civil rights, supporter of unionism. At the very least, you know, he believed in the preservation of the United States, of the law and order that it represented, right? He very much was, you know, a believer in federal authority over the states. And so he wasn't an anarchist, but... Yeah, I think definitely the there is a a tendency online to take the most extreme radical thing possible and use that for discussion. Mm -hmm. So, Niels, you lived in in Georgia. Yes. So, what are your experience? What, what's your experience with? I, I actually you know, like. I'm glad you asked because I kind of was thinking as 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 Ben was talking about Sherman and sort of some of the racism and the community. Um, so. Let's see which story I'm going to tell in this regard. Like, uh, obviously, Sherman is a lightning rod. Like, I, like, there's like, I think when one of my my Macon book came out, like, former student of mine, John, like, posted about it, and this other student who had been at Middle Georgia comes out and is like, I hate Sherman. He destroyed my parents or my great 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 whatever family's farm, and I was like, Well, he probably was Confederate. So what do you expect? <laughs> you know, like, I, I didn't say that, but I kind of was thinking that. <laughs> Um, but after the, um, what was it, 2017 incident in Charlottesville, I had um, Trey Wellburn and, ah, uh, goodness, what's his name? Um, 
I'm sorry <laughs> if he's listening in. Um, my colleague from Fort Valley State University came up and we did a little forum of like Confederate monuments, Confederate memory. And student of mine actually did a great job. He invited the Sons of Confederate Veterans. He invited the former mayor of Macon to this forum, who's a massive lightning rod, like community organizer he invited. Like we had a pretty interesting group and even media in the audience. Uh, one guy reminded me sort of of like when you when you, if you have watched Sean Oliver's episode of like the um on the on the on the Confederacy, he, he calls one of the guys like Confederate Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the guys he actually also said, Oh, I'm not racist because I had black I represented black guys in my union I was like <laughs> like total. But point being, um I had this African American community organizer in, in the audience who raised the point of like, look, I think Confederate monuments are bad. I think Confederate names for streets are bad. Yet and this was an important point that I found very, impro very important that he raised. I live on Jefferson C. Davis Street in Macon. Not, not the president, Jefferson Davis, but the Union general who cuts a pontoon bridge to let hundreds of African-American camp followers stuck. So I, I think that's sort of that legacy that you're... There is this anti-Confederate aspect, but there's also a critical engagement of like who is Sherman that like is he's a good guy is he a bad guy is he sort of the mix there mm -hmm. um so point Sherman is always bad to white southerners <laughs> but there's also I felt especially with some organized in African American community not an undivided loyalty to Sherman and his generals that they were they were surprisingly critical work i even had to think for a moment of like oh jefferson c davis what did he do again oh oh yes i totally get that um so yeah um well, there you that go reminds, that, that, that reminds me i've i just finished reading um lorraine foot's right to retaliation mm -hmm. um and you know the, the very last part of, of of her book is on 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 sherman and uh, kind of the limits of of, of civilized warfare. Uh, and uh, Ben, I noticed that you talked about, you, you cited um, Mark Grimsley, uh, yeah. the hard yeah, hand of total war. war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that was the first instance that I had uh, when I read it a while ago um, of Sherman's actual military moderation. He was actually sticking yes. pretty well to the plan and exactly. he didn't really go out. On the other hand, reading... Uh, Lorraine Foote's book, um, yeah, his his staff officers were not happy with how how much the stragglers were getting getting uh, away with. So there is that divided, that very very divided uh, uh, image legacy that he that he's left. So yeah, you're talking mm -hmm. about a lightning rod. I mean, well, and then you see these people on. On Reddit, who are who on the on Sherman posting, who are going to find a little detail, and they're going to blow it up, and they're going to re-engage uh, public discourse about it with a meme, um, yeah. and bring it back into the into the limelight. I mean, it's yeah, a fascinating, you're absolutely right. fascinating. No, you're right, Andy. That people will take these small historical incidents and sort of blow them up into like an entire point for dialogue, which is great. But what gets lost in many of those instances is context, right? Like, uh -huh. you know, Sherman lived a whole life before the war, after the war. Uh, what does his treatment of indigenous peoples, for instance, say about what his role was in American history? Uh, some of that not being universally terrible. For instance, he was kind-ish to the Navajos in the American Southwest, as opposed to, yeah, kind-ish, exactly. But I mean, <laughs> compared to how he treated other native peoples, right? I'm uh -huh. sure the Navajos might see things differently. Um, but I think the best source that I read for this project um, actually was something that I read long before I consider this, which is Sarah Ann Rubin's book on mm -hmm. Sherman's march through American memory, right? And how this is a topic that very much lives with us in the present day. It means one mm -hmm. thing in particular to Georgians, to South Carolinians, to people you know who had to suffer through the various marches that Sherman did in 1864 mm -hmm. and 65. So 
it's it's important to not sever that context, I think, to get so hyper focused on these tiny details in our drive to make you know thought provoking memes that we lose track of the big picture. Mm -hmm. And as great as it is, as easy it is to, to sort of slap a meme together in the course of just a few minutes, making sure that we aren't mindful of what what's the background here, what are the outcomes, what's mm -hmm. the broader historical trajectory doesn't get lost as we make this sort of new form of internet discourse take root. Well, that that being said, um, one thing you did you did mention, and I think this is uh, really interesting. Um, yeah, the 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 redditors might uh, make a meme out of you know one one tiny detail, but uh, I found it really uh, interesting that they were um, that generally speaking they're well read on uh, on current scholarship. Uh, Very much so. As opposed to yeah. sharing, getting their news from Facebook or from, from YouTube. Or is that neo-confederate literature? What that um, the Davis trial book? <laughs> what is that? Oh, it's the sure. it's these two neo-confederate law scholars who wrote a book, practically putting Jefferson Davis on trial and kind of going through like what. What accusations they are, and what's the re what if those accusations were actually real or not? And of course, um, they weren't, and he was not. Of course not, not guilty yeah. of treason, and no, yeah, of course not. yeah, yeah. So like it, it's 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 this harebrained weird bug, but it's like, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, I yeah, think that's is, yeah, but yeah, I mean, this is that's exactly what 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 yeah. Yeah, they're, they're up with the they're 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 on point with the scholarship, um. Mm -hmm. But whether scholars will accept their their participation, that's something else, I guess, entirely. But the, the breadth of content you can see on here is pretty amazing because they'll make historiographic arguments as much as they'll make historical ones, right? Like, for instance, Woodrow Wilson is not well liked at all on this subreddit because of his you can't even call him a neo-Confederate, right? I guess just an old school Confederate himself almost, since he was born into Civil yeah. War itself, right? Um but there's definitely an appreciation for, you know, what are the big Civil War books that are coming out, what, whether those are scholarly in nature or popular. Uh, I know, for instance, that people are very enamored of Ron Chernow's biography of Ulysses S. Grant that is coming up on seven or eight years old now. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a very popular read on the subreddit. But, you know, they also look at what's coming out of the academy these days. What are new ways that scholars are thinking about the American Civil War? So they are remarkably well read about history as well as historiography so we need to make it's, sure we post this video to it <laughs> what's that we need to make sure that when we when i post the videos that or the um, podcast that we post that on the on that reddit so they can listen to what we are talking about well but that, yes. and it gives them some it gives them legitimacy as well because yeah. i mean no well, yeah, and but I think the other points that you kind of raised is that I sort of was interesting kind of thinking about your piece and especially kind of like what's the focal point, right? When it comes to Sherman and Georgia, it's it's a burning of Atlanta, even though he really didn't burn Atlanta. Most of that is just gone with the wind kind of stuff that later on is created. But how much is somewhat the the imagery that we see coming out in these memes and sort of in in some people's perception there built around that sort of that image of Sherman as sort of that destructor of some Southern communities rather than like the realities of like, no, Hood burned Atlanta just as much as Sherman did and Confederates burned Columbia just as much as Sherman did, you know, like it's... This is more than one story. Some of the nuance and the subtlety that you'll see maybe in the comments sections, but those don't get transformed into memes mm. as much. So maybe yeah, as they listen to this podcast, Redditors will think about, oh, what, what new subject areas can we do? How can we dunk on oh. Confederates even <laughs> further in the future? <laughs> that, totally, yeah. right? <laughs> well, uh, you know, and the little details that you, that you mentioned, I mean, um, I, I made a note here of uh, talking about uh, one one popular post that uh, that uh, satirized the segregationists at uh, of, of Central High School in, in Little Rock. Um, and you have these uh, 
stubbly segregationist, um, short bald stubbly segregationist, um, who are contrasted uh, with these uh, bearded soldiers and black students who are very the big shaggy, well defined chin, big shaggy beards, and who epitomize masculinity. And that racists, and I quote, cannot achieve true Americanness. So the manliness of the of the of the um, rather the unmanliness, I guess, of the of the segregationists and the racists. The, the little, yeah. I know. <laughs> let me let me pull that up because I didn't actually include that image in the article, but here it is online. And this actually draws from oh. a very popular meme format. It's called Soy Jack versus Chad. Um, Soy Jack would refer to the gentleman on the left here, the, the stubbly face guy, right? It's like, oh, he can't even grow a beard, um, who's rep meant to represent the segregationists. Whereas on the right, you have, you know, federal armed National Guards. You've got one of the students who's going to desegregate Central High at Little Rock. And they're clearly drawn with these impressive mustaches, these pronounced strong chins, piercing eyes, as opposed to this crying neo-Confederate over here. So this is a very common meme format online, right? Where we'll turn the person that we don't like into the soy jack who's like emasculine, childish, and we'll turn people that we agree with and that we support into the the Chad or the guy who's like seen as muscular, the epitome of this like Nordic masculinity. And there's actually a really troubled history sort of behind that meme format. And I appreciate the fact that here it's being reclaimed, right? Like they're using Chad to, you know, a black man gets to participate in his Chadness, if you will. Mm. So in this instance, it's sort of uh, using what has historically been a problematic meme format and making it more productive, inclusive, and civil rights minded. Yeah, and see, I didn't know the image. Um, so yeah, when, when I was reading this, I, I didn't have that in, in, in mind. And I'm glad you have the names as well of the of the meme characters um because occasionally yeah you do see the names popping up or you see references to well, obviously a chad you see the chads but the the soy jack i don't know if i'd ever heard the heard or read the name but it's mm -hmm. never used in a in a positive way that's a definite yeah, absolutely. It's it's sort of a stereotype, right? I mean it's sort of like the 19th century political stereotypes that we might see in cartoons about government people or heaven knows the way that the Chinese or African Americans were stereotyped in popular media back in the 19th century, um, which is not to say that you know, this meme is, that we just that I just shared is inherently racist because it's I think quite the opposite. Um, but it's interesting to me that it's tapping into that shared sort of visual lexicon that people online would already have access to and sort of assuming, okay, you have a working body of knowledge. How can we sort of modify that into a more pro-civil rights, pro-union form? Yeah, I, I love it. <laughs> it's, but I, 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 I kind of feel reminded was one of the things that you kind of um, wrote to that sort of the sort of the dangers that lies in sort of these broad brush strokes that you're using here that potentially lose some of the the nuance of of a historical situation how much is that a conversation point among this this reddit community i'd say it's a very deep one uh, again they're very historically very historiographically engaged if you go into the comments sections on these posts People will bring up the most obscure stories about, you know, here's the what, you know, here's an obscure station of the Underground Railroad and how it was still operating during the Civil War. Or here's what this exact regiment from Iowa was doing in battle at Shiloh in 1862. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the the amount of historical detail that they have here is impressive. And the, the way that they use sort of smaller stories to suggest a larger narrative or to be like, and here's what it all means more broadly speaking for us as pro-union, pro-American people, they never lose sight of the big picture. They are able to use the way we as historians kind of do. They're able to sort of find historical details, find primary sources and say, here's the point. Here's the argument I'm trying to make based on that. So in their own way, even though they're using visual culture more than you know scholarly manuscripts, mm -hmm. they're kind of doing the same thing on Sherman posting that the rest of us do in writing book manuscripts or publishing articles. They're trying to use history to make a certain argument and form where we are in the present. And so 
at that very broad philosophical level, I just have to respect and appreciate and dare I say support sort of what red redditors are doing, at least on Sherman posting. Hmm. Well, again, it's breaking down the the divisions and giving us exactly. opportunity for more for more exchange and the initiation of new um, of new ideas and. And you know, in in part, I I kind of ask that too because I, I, as weird as it is, looking back now, um, I was, one of my, my lectures was on, like I I eventually turned my U.S. survey into a public history kind of memory focus and was like, okay, it reads a textbook, figure out what what happened, and then we're gonna talk in class about how we remember what happened and how that differs. And of course, as a Civil War historian, I did a, did a significant section on um, the Civil War memory, uh, reconstruction, the battlefields. And there was one meme, I'm going to, for, for those who are watching, going to share that here real quick. <clears throat> and I will describe it for the listeners. Um, so this was a meme I think John Legg found it for me and has, uh, shared it with me. So it's text here. The federal government feels bad about Hiroshima and Nagasaki with images of the atomic bomb cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And then the second line of images and text, but never gave a second thought to Columbia, Charleston, Atlanta, Richmond, and Nashville with five pictures. And then closing here, the South is ready for her apology. <laughs> Um, I think this ties really beautiful with Sherman because Atlanta and Columbia are two cities that he actually attacked and destroyed. I used it in my class primarily to kind of say, where's the propaganda value in this, right? Like, why did somebody build this? And I, like, when, when I first saw it, I was like, wait a minute, Charleston never got burned by the U.S. forces. That was an accidental fire in I think it was December of 1861. Like the picture of Nashville is actually Harper's Ferry, right? It's like it it it's totally like uh, yeah, Columbia is the right one. Atlanta is I think Richmond actually. So it's like it's totally wrong. But how much could of when we look at memes, how much do we have to watch that as sort of like obviously the guys on Reddit. They know what they're doing. We know what's go what's going on. But for the casual observer, I'm kind of thinking here, like the person that's on scrolling through Reddit all of a sudden sees this meme pop up. How important is it that like when when they see something like that, somebody steps in and is like, no, 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 <laughs> this is totally wrong. Like, how big is that danger? I'd say it's enormous. We have to consider the fact that every time someone makes a meme they do so with a political agenda mm -hmm. there's a very famous instance on reddit where there was a very strong libertarian community that posted an image showing this some dilapidated rundown slum saying this is what a communist country looks like and then there was like this nice country club looking villa captioned oh but here's a capitalist country and then someone had to come in and comment actually that Slum is Detroit, and the very nice-looking photo that you've chosen is Cuba. So congratulations, you've mixed up capitalism and communism and sort of their impact. So, which is not to make a point about economy, which is not to get political, but it's to show the ease with which um, things can be sort of slotted into categories that they don't actually belong in, where, um, you know, false information can be propagated. And as soon as this was pointed out, the guy who made the actual meme said, wait, really? And he seems like unaware of what he'd done and guilty, like he wasn't trying to spread misinformation. But that doesn't change the fact that he did peddle falsehoods online. So okay. we have to be really mindful of what's coming out from where everyone has an agenda. Is there a way that we're able to disentangle this? And if it's, you know, John Doe's 420 online posting information and we don't necessarily know where he is, what his background is, what his yeah. political beliefs are, then it can be sort of difficult to, to find the agenda. Uh, I had a follow up on that, kind of a two part follow up. Um, do do you know? Uh, uh, do we know who the members are of these of these groups? I mean, 
in terms of are, are they like from the United States? May, maybe or do we know? Primarily, they are American. I actually just saw a um a thread on some the Sherman posting as I was getting ready to to talk to you guys this morning, where someone said, "Hey, I'm from Northern Europe. Are we welcome here as well?" And the people were like, "Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Anyone who has an interest in history and applying it to the present totally has a place in this community." Wow. But as far as like individual identities or people's backgrounds, unless they share that in a post or unless they like have a really detailed Reddit bio page that you're not unfortunately going to have access to where they came from or what oh. it is that they're trying to prove. So that's why I think it's important to really just sort of step back and look at the big picture and be like, okay, what's the, what are the patterns that we see among these memes? What's getting oh. votes or likes and what's getting ignored? Yeah, and what we'll... is getting ignored? <laughs> Sorry, Andy. No, no, no. I'm go, kind go of ahead, curious. No, 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 what, what, yeah. what is being ignored? What what are they not dealing with a lot? Well, anything that's pro South, of, of course, yeah. Usually, <laughs> will either that'll either get ignored or it'll get brought on and said, look, look at how wrong these people are. Look at how they want to continue to sow division and break right. the United States apart and violate civil liberties just because you know they had the Confederacy for four years. Mm. Okay. Um, that's so that's the kind of stuff that gets ignored. I guess the Sulkis community is also very militarily and politically focused. So okay. stuff on the economic aspect of the war or culture and society maybe doesn't receive as much attention. It's still there. It just cool. doesn't. It, it's not front and center the way pictures of Sherman leading his army on horseback are. <laughs> so it's a very politically, militarily minded subreddit. And I sort of get that. That's how I came about the Civil War, right? Like reading, you know, these grand narratives of hundreds of thousands of men going into battle against each other and, you know, elections and the fate of nations. So that's that's what draws a lot of us to the Civil War to begin with. So I can't fault them for focusing on that topic above others. Well, um, and then kind of jumping on that, um, you you, you mentioned Matt, the kind of kind of uh, topics that are. Um, not directly Civil War related um, on Sherman posting, but uh, that promotes uh, kind of anti-Southern tropes. So for example, mapping the existence of slavery, comparing the maps of, of the existence of slavery, uh, slavery with um, different social issues, uh, for example, education and poverty, you know, it looks like the um, covering the same zones, the areas where there's where where, where there was slavery, uh, are the areas where um, there's where the there's more child uh, mal um, mistreatment um, than in other parts of the United States, things like that. Um, are those types of posts um, as popular as the directly Sherman related memes and and posts? It sort of they certainly have the potential to be i mean it sort of just depends on what kind of mood people are in um i would say that the trend here is to think broadly about sort of what's what's good for the union what's historically inclusive and, and beneficial it's not universally focused on sherman um for instance right now i'm looking at the home page of sherman posting and i only see like one image of him Whereas I can see lots of images of, oh, here's the Klan and someone's flipping off a Ku Klux Klan pin, um, other civil rights related materials, uh, questions about, you know, how did this Civil War monument come up? So it's not universally focused on Sherman. Um, he's not, it, it's not always just pithy memes, right? Like those are just sort of the entry point into what I think are actually pretty interesting multifaceted and deeply engaged scholarships of the civil war so it's not all like just stuff about the battle it's very much focused on like civil rights and how do we perceive the union and the confederacy today that that's really the I mean that people are going through right now especially since that whole texas secessionist movement came about a couple months ago people are like oh no we you know we tried this once texas so how did that work out for you back in 1861 well, okay. So, the, sorry, Niels. I'm 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 kind of hogging the the mic here. Um. So, okay. So then, my my second part of the second part of the question that I had earlier was, um, who um, how how visible is is Sherman posting on as a subreddit? So, 
um, I don't use Reddit very much. I have it on my phone. Um, and until until reading your article, I had never seen Sherman posting. So I went to Sherman posting and I joined it because I think it's a really interesting, interesting sub you know, subreddit. It's a really interesting group. Um, someone, an average Reddit user, first time Reddit user, or someone who you know, uses it occasionally. How, I guess it all depends on the algorithm, of course, but um, how um, powerful is the subreddit in terms of the, 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 the site's algorithm? Is it going to pop up randomly on somebody's on somebody's feed, or is it something that you would have to look through? You'd have to search for civil war, or you'd have to search for secession, or um, Republicans, or Trump, or something, in order to get to it, in order to have it pop up as one of your results. Until recently, you probably would have had to do a pretty deep dive to find it, but there have been a couple cases where pieces of information, whether those are news articles or memes that were published to this community, get aggregated into the site's all page, which is like, mm. takes some of the most popular upcoming stuff from across Reddit. And, you know, when it appears on the front page of Reddit, sometimes this information is is likely to reach communities that it wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. I think also that there are a ton of communities about the past and especially about memeing history on Reddit, and they're starting to pick up on Sherman Posting. Like anything that is pro-union, like, oh, Sherman Posting would love this. Or if there's any pro-Confederate stuff, they'd be like, hmm, let's share it to Sherman Posting and see what those guys and gals think about it. Mm. So it's not the most visible community. It only has 120,000 or so members. And you can have Reddits that are like have tens of millions of members. So in terms of scale, it's much smaller. Um, but it's not a complete unknown. And then I had another one. Sorry, Niels. Go ahead. Uh, you talked about the Texas secession, the Texit movement. So a question I had a long time ago, and then you brought it up again with this with this Texas independence thing. Um, uh, over on, on Twitter, X, uh, you have a lot of, um, well, it's propaganda. You have these uh, Russian trolls or bots. I don't know if they're trolls or if they're humans or, 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 or bots who are you know, propagating this thing. Um, do you have that type of uh, interaction and that type of content creation on, on Reddit and, sub and, and subreddits like this? Or are these actual human beings producing these, 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 these memes or this content for the subreddit? You definitely have, there's a bot problem on Reddit as much as there is on X or on Facebook. Um, I, I think on Sherman posting, it's not as much of a problem. The stuff is pretty closely moderated. And whenever people make, posts to Sherman posting, they'll usually have like some explanatory um, caption exp saying, this is why I posted this here. Or they'll have they'll like the original posters will take part in dialogues underneath the post. So I can't say for sure that there are no bots on Sherman posting, but certainly they would have to do a, it would be more difficult for them to hide just because this community does have really deep historically informed discussions and so bots would get called out pretty quickly yeah. but again reddit as a whole definitely has a bot problem as much as any social medium does i mean people most of the time it's just you know people creating bots to post pictures of dogs sometimes to go foment secession like tags it and other ridiculous um, sort of political separatist movements but i haven't seen too too much evidence of that on sherman posting that, that was my question and i appreciate that yeah, of course. It's it's a very prescient one. It's I, and that's oh, yeah. you know a big challenge to digital history as a whole, not just on Reddit, but like is the information that's being produced coming from an actual human being? Because oh. we're going to reach a point in a few years now where the AI algorithms will be sophisticated enough to create their own photorealistic images, generate captions, and make falsehoods. So that's a, probably a discussion for another day, but something that we as historians will have to confront sooner than later. Sooner well, I mean, than later. <laughs> yeah, sooner than later, because I, I, yeah. I recently saw like, what was it? Black samurais and black black people dressed as like Nazi uniforms that were AI generated, where you kind of were like, wow, who even falls for this? You know, like, it, like this is so obviously incorrect that it's like, but of course, like, right? Like, it's, it's these images that we said earlier, where it's like, yeah, it's that guys that produces this image of third world versus first world and <laughs> it's like an image from cuba and detroit in the complete wrong way 
like I had a guy who like I, I think it was when I forget the context, but he opposed the statement I made on I think it was Facebook. And he put a picture of like, oh, there's this care Mexico is guarding its borders to Guatemala. But he uses a picture that's out there, commonly used, that is actually the a border wall um in Israel. And you're like, dude, did you, did you even check? Like, you know? Um, like it's 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 mind boggling in, in regard to like the it's, potential it's for misinformation. Yes, it's frustrating to me because we all come from what I like to call a fact-based discipline or an evidence-based yeah. discipline. We're very similar to scientists in that we have to come up with information. We have to say, this is how we acquired it. This is yeah. how we are able to verify its authenticity. We can't just make stuff up to prove a point. And those historians who have tried that in the past have you know, had their tenure stripped, been rejected from academia, and rightfully so. So the fact that the internet allows people to sort of create and spread misinformation in minutes, whereas it takes us months or even years to get our books or scholarly articles out, means that we're sort of at a massive disadvantage here. Mm -hmm. People will be susceptible to misinformation, and since the, their first impressions might be rooted in that mis- or even disinformation, mm -hmm. it'll be very hard to dislodge those first impressions from people's minds. So unfortunately, as we move forward, we're going to as historians or scholars or even just engaged members of society, we're going to have to find ways to have authenticity checks built into whatever content that we're producing. So would that be a web 3.0 then? <laughs> but you know, I don't know if we're at web 3.0, if we're going to have to skip straight past to like web four five or, or 10 point <laughs> because <laughs> just how quickly digital technology is evolving. Right. Like when I started, when I first started my job at the university where I work VR and 3D printing were just taking off and becoming like commercial mainstream products. Whereas today it's like, oh yeah, those are both well ensconced. I won't call them old news, but now it's all about AI and um, computer generated art. And who knows where we're going to be in five or 10 years or five or 10 months at this rate. Yeah, yeah true. And it was AI, it's just going faster and faster. That and, um, <clears throat> Very big pivot here. One thing that considering all... So much of the memes are image-based, right? It's not just text, it's images that we're using. And obviously Sherman images are easy, like that's, they, he got photographed 170 years ago, so we have no issues. But what about copyright? That's a great question. I haven't really <laughs> applied it to Sherman <laughs> posting because, I mean, so many of these people are doing it for nonprofit reasons, right? Like they're not right. generating any sort of financial benefit from what they're doing but they're really just doing it to have fun on the internet and to, you know hopefully change, change somebody's mind to make them a little sure. bit more union focused um but that's that's really copyright isn't something that enters into discussion a lot online maybe it should um i also i'm not super you know i'm an archivist and i should admit this i'm not super current up to date on copyright law but stuff that was you know 100 and some odd years old has mostly entered the public domain. So if you right. take a picture of Sherman, for instance, it's usually royalty-free, okay. tax-free, especially if it's like from Library of Congress or National Archives, where it's like free for public consumption. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, we maybe we really need to be very considerate as meme makers that we're going on to Creative Commons and trying to get all of our images from there rather than mm -hmm. um, downloading things. But that's a broad sort of question that the internet really needs to grapple with and how is AI going to complicate that in the future? Well, yeah, I was thinking in terms of like how many times have students pulled something from the internet and we're like, oh, I found it on the internet. And you're like, where? <laughs> right? Google. But it's, uh, yeah, Google, Google gave it to me. But it's sort of like, like the photographer from the AP who goes to a Trump rally and takes this photograph like he's not credited with oh this is a photograph of mine that was used for this meme um so like part of me is like it's a meme we're having fun it's sort of like artistic work on some level that comes out of it on the other hand as the historian i'm kind of like but there's somebody whose work is being used you know like um so I, i'm not i'm not sure how i'm supposed to feel about this <laughs> Well, then I have another kind of, I made me think of something else. Um, 
of course, when you go to Reddit, Facebook, whatever, any social media, uh, social media, you, you need to create an account. So anything that you post then, um, does that oh. become the copyright property of the intellectual property of the company that owns the social, the social media company? So if say you take a picture of Donald Trump from the, an, uh, an AP photographer's picture of Donald Trump at a rally, you, you meme it up for Sherman posting, you post it to Sherman posting. Does that then become the property of Reddit? Oh, that's a great question. I'm sure the owners of social media, <laughs> for instance, the gentleman who owns X would probably have a strong opinion about ownership of what gets posted on his website. Uh, but it's something that just hasn't been sussed out. And that Ooh. plays into this broader question that we see of authority on Sherman posting or social media in general, which is who are the authors or creators of these pieces that we use? In many cases, they don't really care if they're credited or not. They just like, oh, I made this right. thing, post it out there. If it gets some likes, great. If it makes some traction, fantastic. But I'm, they're not like trying to get profit off of it. They're not trying to make a living. It's really just a hobby for a lot of people oh. um, and a potentially good and beneficial hobby. But they don't, they also don't necessarily get heartbroken if their content is taken down or removed for copyright reasons. It's like, okay, I'll go make another one. I'll go make five or 10 more memes in the times that it would have taken me to write a post on X complaining about, oh, I had my subreddit content well, taken down. Well, and, and this is, you're talking about uh, the, the name Sherman posting is a, is a, is a, a play on shit posting. Right. And I think that that's exactly what you're talking about. I mean, you can shit post just, just tons of stuff. Yeah, you could crank out, yeah, exactly, tons of low effort memes. And so if some of it doesn't end up, then no harm, no foul. I'll just go make more. And just having a good time, you know, get as much stuff out there as you can. And uh, yeah. That's the key, having a good time, making a community, doing yeah. something meaningful. Um, even if there are setbacks, I think the people on Chairman Posting would agree that they've accomplished something, that they have created a community around mm -hmm. the historicity of the American Civil War, of Sherman, and most importantly, the idea that these notions still have a, something important to perform in the 21st century, that these should be vital aspects of the political culture that we have created and hope to sustain in an increasingly fraught age. And the fact that we're able to take this digital technology that many people point to as subversive of, oh, Reddit or places like uh, X and Facebook are being overrun by bots that are trying to undermine American democracy. We're seeing a more constructive use I think of mm -hmm. digital technologies in a pro historical way. So well, as, as a counterpoint, as a very yes, local counterpoint. Exactly. Yeah, a very strong one, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But that's what that's what really attracted me to this community is that it's still taking off. And yet I think it's already accomplished something, right? It's already made a name for itself. It's already shown here's a model that we can follow if we want to make history relevant in an age of mis or disinformation. Which kind of raises a question like, A. Hey, do you make your students produce memes? <laughs> and how do we get more historians to produce memes for this kind of stuff? Like, I, 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 I get, the, I have the feeling, but I don't, like, I have no substance for this. I get the feeling that most historians kind of just dismiss memes for the most part, or kind of, it's like a cute little icebreaker to start a class, but I don't think they take it very serious. So how do we get gets that activism going because we share them all the time right they're beautiful they're fun like you said so how do we how do we translate that into more professionals doing it i think we're starting to see that a little bit more i follow a number of different historical libraries archives museums mm -hmm. on instagram for instance as i'm sure all of us do yeah. And every now and then they'll use images from their collections to create memes. Mm -hmm. It's a first step. It, that's not the same as it gaining widespread academic purchase in, say, uh, manuscripts that historians are churning out. But I think it is a, a solid first step. Mm -hmm. I also like to, when I explain memes to my students, whenever I teach about them, position them in the much broader cosmos of American visual culture with uh, the political cartoons dating back to the 18th century, evolving into comic strips by the 19th and early 20th. And then the emergence of um, photography and film as another form of visual culture. Memes are just the latest evolution of that. Then, of course, at every step of the way, people, when those technologies were emerging, 
sometimes adopted them. Other segments of society were reluctant to take them on. I think we're just sort of at that initial stage with memes still, right? They've been around mm. for, you know, 15-ish to 20 years. There's still an emerging idea in the grand scheme of things. So while they're popular among younger folks and on the internet, um, there's still going to be those people who sort of resist the technological change. And I don't know how to reach them other than to say maybe attrition, maybe, you know, as the new generation comes in and realizes the value of this, they just sort of. The old folks need to die off. uh, Or or just retire even, right? Just, you know, go go live out your golden years. I mean, you talked about Earl Hess earlier. Yeah. I mean, mean, that was where I was thinking, like when, uh, as we started, I was like, well, wait a minute. There was a conversation about digital history written by somebody who, Everyone who reads the piece was like, why would you ask this person to write about digital history who has never done anything with digital history? Like It, it just was mind boggling. Um, on the other hand, I was going to say like, I mean, you're saying 10, 15 years here. I mean, from an internet perspective, that's that's old news almost. It's a lifetime. Exactly. <laughs> it is. Yeah. I mean, it depends on who you ask. Yeah. To the internet yeah. people, to folks who you know, were barely even alive 15 years ago, they were like, oh yeah, that's ancient history. Um, whereas you talk to geologists, they'd be like, oh no, sure. that's like seconds that's ago. And sick. I think we as historians are like, 15 years ago is really not that long in the grand scheme of things. But but you're right, to the people who are using technologies, 15 years ago, the memes looked completely different. They probably weren't as sophisticated politically or structurally mm-hmm. as they are today, if we can even call them sophisticated, uh, yeah. which I would. But yeah, it's, it's just, again, it's a matter of perspective. There's always going to be people who, take this technology seriously who accept it and other folks who are like well let's pump the brakes and you know not necessarily just adopt it without some critical analysis of what's actually going on here well earlier you you used the word authority as in talking about authors but i think authority as well um in the sense of who has the authority over to judge history is it is it people uh, in the academy who refuse to to adapt to new technology, or is it the people who are actually out there mm-hmm. doing this shit posting, creating all this content, and and getting discussion started? And that also brings up the question of, like Neil's getting back to what you said, yeah. do me, do memes actually need to be serious, or can they just be a, a kind of a fun jumping off point for a really serious discussion, which I think is the case with with Sherman posting. I think it's a little column A and a little bit of column B, right? Like the memes are just sort of inseparable from humor to me, right? Like if you're not making somebody laugh, if you're not trying to create humor, then why are you using a meme? Why wouldn't you just tweet something out, right? Um, And of course, some people are always going to be dismissive of humor, but I think there's always a place for it in society. I think humor always reveals a deeper impulse. I always have to go back to... um, One of the TV shows I watched when I was growing up, MASH, it's Mobile Army (laughs) Surgical Hospital. You know, yeah, I don't need to explain it to you guys, but for people, yeah, but for people who might not know, it's about um, a medical unit in the uh, Korean War, American soldiers, particularly doctors, trying to, you know, alleviate people's suffering in the midst of this carnage. And one of the main themes of the show is that the main character, Hawkeye, and his, his straight man, Trapper, and then later BJ, joke about everything. They don't take anything seriously. They could be in the OR, like elbow deep in some guy's intestines, and they're still whistling past the gallows using this black humor to confront the fact that, oh, you know, there could be cannonballs dropped on us at any time. So let's, you know, make a PG-13 or R-rated joke. Um, And some of these characters on MASH will repeatedly come out and say, you know, this is our way of coping with the stress, the trauma, the horrors of this conflict through humor, which is to say that Humor can serve a deeper function than simply making people laugh. It is a very revealing psychological uh, impulse that is shared across humanity. And I think we see that with memes as well. Yeah, the original purpose is to entertain people, maybe get a deep belly laugh out of them. But then to get them to think afterwards and be like, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, I may not have taken this seriously if it didn't make me laugh at first. And then I paid greater attention to it. So I think there's value in the humor that we see coming out of memes. Well, is there, um, do you think, I'm just th- thinking about the the general tendency of uh, trend, uh, tendency, the trend the general trends of of uh, memes that I see um, come across my different feeds. Um, and you're talking about humor. Um, most of it's really dark humor. And I was thinking, um, you know, my work is generally on Civil War era as well. And so thinking of Thomas Nast, and right now I'm reading Dangerous Stir by um, 
Mark Olger and Summers and um, rereading it. And, you know, he's got a lot of um, a lot of Thomas Nast's um, drawings from you know, Andrew Johnson's administration. And they are really, really dark. And I think there, there's definitely humor to them, but it, it's not ha ha humor. It's oh shit humor. Mm hmm. Yes, yeah. there's always an element of provocateurness, right? And that really carries through, I think, rather nicely to a lot of our memes that they're meant to shock you so much that you have to pay attention. So it's almost a tactic to like get people to stop what they're doing and fully engage with this content. But so it's that that's what my read on it is psychologically. Um, and you see a little bit of that on Sherman posting, but it's kind of unavoidable in a topic where, you know, over half a million people died in, in this conflict over the fundamental nature of the human character of the freedom and slavery so like i mean it's tragic yeah the gallus humor is just sort of cooked in well and you have it at the time you have it still today right that's so just the nature of how do you cope with so much loss that just it's it's hard to kind of imagine uh, i did want to pivot it so a little bit further because like like we kind of established like from certain perspectives, memes being around for 10 or 15 years is short or long, whatever it is. <laughs> um, is there a Sherman posting on TikTok? Because that seems to be the new thing that a lot of people go to like, oh, let me make this two minute video or 30 second video um, and grab people's attention. And it seems that that would be an interesting medium as well to kind of, takes a meme into a into a into a video format it would i when i consider memes i'm very much trying to restrict myself to still images because if you go to videos then that opens up tiktok it opens up youtube and instagram and there's fascinating sources there but i'm trying to like limit myself in terms of what i'm looking at right now but you're right tiktok is the hot thing of the minute i mean if you look at downloads since 2020 it outpaces every other social medium by yeah. ridiculous intervals, by a ridiculous amount. And there is pro Sherman content on there. And sometimes you'll actually see TikTok videos reposted to Reddit or reposted to Instagram or Facebook or any other social media site. So there is an interoperability here, right? That just because something originates on Twitter doesn't mean that it's not going to make its way over to Instagram or mm -hmm. Reddit eventually. So... That well, I, I want to be. I don't want to call the divisions between social media arbitrary or indistinct because they they are, but there are ways to surmount them and sort of create communities across them as well. Well, I was going to say that there are there are historians who do a lot of uh, TikTok videos. You know that are mm -hmm. fifteen seconds, thirty seconds, two minutes, as you're saying. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there might be a way to translate that into. What Niels, you were saying about memes yeah, and the yeah. divisions. I mean, you see the divisions, uh, kind of the barriers drop when you're. Uh, I have Facebook, of course. You know, you get the reels on there, and you get things in from from TikTok, and you get things in from Instagram as well. Um, but that's pretty much it. You don't get much more. You don't get Reddit, uh, sub sub subreddits. You don't get memes from 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 Twitter X. You don't get um, right. yeah. Exactly. They sort of transcend authority in that way. It doesn't really matter who created them or where they put them. What matters is how they spread. What matters is what people take away from them and how they put them here. So that interpretive component of what we do with memes and how we take them out into the world, that's what matters. All right. Now we're we're getting into our towards hour and a half slowly. We probably should get towards the end. Okay. <laughs> of course, I have the feeling that after 20 minutes, a lot of people, unfortunately, will switch off unless they're in the gym like Andy and listening to it. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's mainly in the car. I have to admit it's mainly in the car. <laughs> well, I know a few people who listen to us on the car. So if you listen to us in the car right now, we know you're listening to us in the car right now. Thank you. But I, 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 I was going to ask this broader kind of educational question because I think so many of us and I, I would I would consider myself but Andy you probably are as well we're very traditionally trained that we took our Civil War history class we took our modern America class we took the reading seminar in American history and 
maybe we took like an introduction to public history, kind of a broad overview. Like I, I went back and got a certificate in public history, but most of us don't really encounter public history, um, but instead get forced into like, oh, you have to learn French and Spanish, or you have to learn like these two languages to kind of satisfy some foreign language requirement. Wouldn't it make much more sense, like from the undergrad up to the graduate degree, to make students take two at least introduction classes to public history, not just in sort of like, this is a methodology, but this is how you produce stuff, like produce memes, post memes, um, do TikTok videos. How do you reach an audience? What is an audience interested in? Because like, I mean, let's face it, like, I, I literally just got a email from LSU Press that my, my first book to sold, like, I think it was about 202 copies. Like, you can, that, that's not a big number <laughs> that I reached of people reading my book. But I can post a video and I can reach thousands of people. So the impact of these items is so much higher. So shouldn't we ask for a sink in graduate education, but undergraduate education as well, of like, we need to do more of this? Absolutely. I'm, I'm lucky enough in my position at Laverne that where I'm the archivist and an associate professor of history that I can sort of like bring the archives into the classroom. So I have my students digitize stuff. I'm having them sort of create uh, portfolios of historical content that they share in classroom space. And I don't, I think that's a form of public history, right? Like they have to curate this content and then be able to share it with an audience in the classroom and online as well. Um, I have students create entire digital collections that are available on our outward facing uh, portal. So mm -hmm. I, I really think it's important to have this exposure to public history Ideally, you teach a few public history classes at your university, and maybe you work it into some of your other classes as well. Like I know our um, theory and methods classes at the University of Laverne deal with public history, with monuments, memorials, archives. Yeah. But in terms of how we deal with memes and that sort of content, there's definitely room to, to think about it more creatively moving forward. I, I think we need to be responding to the present times, as you said, and like yeah. thinking, how do we use TikTok or Instagram to reach larger audiences than mm -hmm. those who are just reading academic monographs and how do we tailor that content so that public audiences find it interesting and engaging okay so uh now i never had any public history classes um where i did my undergrad in indianapolis there was a public history master's program um, but i did my master's in french history elsewhere so the public history i, I never had um and so Niels, you're talking about um having having undergrad students having one or two taking one or two classes on public history would it have to be history or could it be could it could it be instead media literacy or something run by uh, yeah. say library science library sciences um, well i mean you could also sing in terms of like co-teaching right i mean like I, the the class that i still remember vividly and love was the class in um okay let me rephrase that. It's a class I really, towards the end, enjoyed a lot. <laughs> I did not enjoy the first half was historiography in my master's program. Like, like good God, Herodotus, Vita, and all these, like, Foucault, ugh, good God. Painful going through that. But in the last five weeks, I think, was five weeks, four weeks or five weeks, the professor brought in professors from the department was like, what do you do? What is the conversation historiographical in your field? And it was amazing just to kind of see these conversations happening, right? And I think that would be a great thing if you kind of, it, it would be very difficult to implement, but it would be great to kind of be like you over there in computer science or IT or whatever your department is, you know how to design a website. You know how to video edit. Come on in. Two weeks. You can have a little time in my classroom. You're in the library. Archives. How do you deal with archives? How do you do like um, 
document preservation like you know like bring somebody from the local historical community society in and like what's the conversation you have right now like uh, i think that's that's that would be the fun because that gives these different voices gives the experts that actually do this on a daily basis the ability and you can always afterwards kind of debrief and be like like we had one time this guy from historic macon give a talk on campus and like I sat there in the background was like, he's talking beep <laughs> gender gentrification and the ousting of African-Americans from like their place in, com in the community. And no one asks the question. No one really critically engaged that. Right. Like afterwards we had like tons of conversations at home about it, but like that's those moments like you let them talk but then you can debrief afterwards with the students and be like okay you heard this that's one way to think about it that's there's another way to think about this right but i think that would be the brilliance kind of like yeah students have to take a historic methods class why not take also one in public history or public engagement and be like here's all these different ways how to do it public engagement that, that's i think that's more what what i was thinking of yeah, exactly. Yeah, because, yeah, digital humanities is certainly a huge part of that. But I think there are other methods that we need to be aware of as well, whether that's public speaking, whether that's designing research projects that appeal to public audiences rather than mm -hmm. manuscripts for other scholars, which certainly have a, a place in the field. But, you know, if we're not reaching a broader audience than that, then I have to question whether what we're doing is worthwhile. <laughs> but maybe that's putting it a little bit too harshly, but I, I have to I have to think that we're reaching an audience of more than just a few hundred people. I've gotten those book reports back as well, Niels, where it's just like, oh, yeah. you know, a few dozen people have bought your book over the last month, few months. And it's like, that's yeah. great. But more of them have like read the th throwback Thursday posts that I put on the archives page for Instagram that I run. So, yeah, yeah. exactly right. Like. I mean, I, I enjoyed writing the book, but you kind of afterwards do raise this sort of question of like, hmm, 200 people. I spend way more than 200 hours writing this thing, <laughs> right? Is well, that... But to be fair, some of those copies ended up at libraries. So True. more than one person will read them in each case. And, you know, they'll get ordered through into a library loan. So they might right. end up crossing state lines, going yeah. different places. So it's not not all is lost. And then, of course, you have the ebook as well, right? Where yeah. I don't know. No, that was the... included, actually. That was included. Okay. <laughs> like, I think there was 19 copies that were ebook sold. <laughs> Well, it's interesting to know that we're still um, in very much in a hard copy world then, that people prefer yeah. to have the book in front of them rather than on Kindle or whatever device they're using to read. Well, that was a debate that I was having, or a debate, it was a conversation I was having with uh, uh, one of my friends on uh, on Blue Sky the other day. Um, differences between, it's great to have an audio book, but it's even better to have the physical copy of the book. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, you might, you might use your 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 audible credit to you know, to listen to a book but you're still going to buy a physical copy anyway exactly right. which yeah. you can see i have not enough of, of course. <laughs> well, okay so so then we talked about we talked about this earlier but uh i don't know how long neil's you want you want to talk and ben you want to talk but um uh, a, little bit more. a little bit more um so you're talking about um in the academy, writing writing for the academy, writing with university presses, peer reviewed books, um, and then earlier we talked about popular historians as well. Their popular mm -hmm. history, writing for or writing for a much more a much broader audience, much more general audience. So somewhere in there, maybe bridging the gap again between the meme world, the world of of, of web two point and published history, whether it be the academy or more general popular history, um, there, 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 there's, there seems like there's got to be a, um, there's, there's got to be room for, for all of that and to come together, to blend together, and something new to come out of it, to produce something new. I think so too. And I think it's a little bit of columns A, B, and C, right? Like I think it is maintaining our traditional scholarship, 
but then maybe mm -hmm. giving book talks or doing public mm -hmm. lectures, mm -hmm. putting stuff on TikTok or Instagram, whether that's our own accounts or through departments of history or departments of uh, libraries that we work at. I think we have to realize that no one method is going to reach every audience, right? So we have to sort of be multimodal in terms of how we engage people, part digital, part in person, part, you know, traditional publishing. So I think if we have a foot in each one of those worlds, which is three feet, and most people don't have three feet, um, then we're able to sort of have the best of all the different worlds at our fingertips. No, I think that's a good point, right? We want to reach the public. Like that's like my first two books, I didn't really think about it. My third book was supposed to reach the public and it of course happened during COVID. Yeah. <laughs> and you're kind of like, ah, I wanted to go out and give talks. I, I kind of desperately sought out these opportunities. And that's then that's the making book, right? Yeah, that's the making book. And you, you kind of like reach all these reach out to all these people and like no, we don't do this currently and blah, blah, blah. And like, but yet that's exactly like the point, right? Of like call in favors and be like, you know, I'm now having the the new book coming out in April. I'm kind of, maybe somebody actually listens to this point still that I'm kind of like, I have interviewed over a hundred people. <laughs> like I, I would like at least 10% of that maybe to invite me for a, or a talk in some form, which would be nice, but you never know. And but that's sort of like go to these don't just go to the universities, right? Go to these public institutions, like go to the libraries, museums, the national parks. Like like I told my co-author, like, you know, if we get a talk in like Atlanta, let's reach out to like Chattanooga and Andersonville and uh, Kennesaw Mountain and be like, hey, we're in the area. You want us to come up? We we'll do it for free. You know, like it's a national park service. They're cash strapped like all of us. Yeah. But it gets us maybe five more extra books sold. Well, and then not to mention podcasts. Right. Yeah. Um, My main source besides, say, Twitter is podcasts. Right. And you know, here we are. <laughs> here we are. That's exactly right. Uh, I don't know how many books um, I've uh, I've bought uh, because I've I've heard authors on pod uh, on podcasts right. recommended or in talking about their books or talking about other things. And mm -hmm. I mean, I ordered two last night from Amazon from podcasts that I listened to this week. So yeah. one of them, of course, was the Octopus Garden. Sorry, that yes. one is not out yet. Okay. No, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we should call it for the two Europeans here a night or Ben a day so he can actually do some stuff if he needs to still go grocery shopping or something here on Saturday um, but it was it, great sorry oh, I was going to say is it is it 11 or is it 10 o'clock be... yeah so most of the day much grand mass majority of the day still ahead of me Okay. Yes, so eleven. Like I think, right? So you're gonna you're gonna get. We get our time change this week, so you you already had that tonight. That's right. Exactly. Well, I hope you can adjust to it. Are you guys springing forward too? Yep. Yep. I think my very son well. will be very happy. <laughs> get an hour I'll, extra I'll sleep. Yeah. Well, good for him. Good attitude. Right. Good for all. Yeah. Good for us. <laughs> Well, again, thank you so much, Ben, for rejoining us and to talk about this like broad-ranging material with regard to digital history, um, Sherman, Reddit, and so on. That was very enlightening and amazing to talk about. Um, also, thank you for Andy to join us um, as co-host today. Um, co yeah, co-host, your co-host today. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so with that, we well, thank you for listening. Um, if you're interested in Ben's article, it's on the Public Historians' website journal um, published this February. And let me just real quick give the title again, Recasting Uncle Billy 